Hello to everyone watching. My name is Christian Switek. Today I will be giving a lecture on the infamous Roman Emperor Nero. This lecture is for History 101 FO4 for the fall semester of 2021 at Muskegon Community College for Professor George Maniades. We will begin this lecture by discussing Nero's early life. Firstly, Nero's biological parents. Nero's father was a man named Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, who lived from 17 BCE to 40 CE. In 32 CE, Gnaeus served as a Roman consul. Gnaeus was a despicable man who was known for his anger and his alcoholism. He was even known to kill on multiple occasions out of this uncontrollable anger, which included a young child playing in the street who he ran over with his chariot. Gnaeus can be seen pictured in the top right corner of the slide. Nero's mother was Agrippina the Younger, who was the daughter of Germanicus. Agrippina lived from 15 to 59 CE. Agrippina held royal blood, being the great-granddaughter of Augustus and sister to the infamous Roman Emperor Caligula. She was a calculated woman who seeks power through the males in her life, including her multiple husbands and her own son. Agrippina can be seen pictured in the bottom right corner of the slide. In 37 CE, Agrippina gave birth to Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, who was later known as Nero. Lucius was raised by both Gnaeus and Agrippina for the first two years of his life, until his mother Agrippina's exile, which was due to a suspected plot against her brother Caligula. After this, Lucius was raised by Gnaeus until Gnaeus' death of Enema, which occurred when Lucius was three years old. After Gnaeus' death, Lucius was raised by his aunt until Agrippina's return from exile, which occurred when Lucius was four years of age. After Agrippina's return from exile, her and Nero, or Lucius, received his father's inheritance, which was previously held by Caligula. Shortly after her return from exile, Agrippina began her second marriage to Gaius Seleucius Pascinus Crispus. Crispus was a wealthy orator and politician who served two terms as a Roman consul. Crispus died in 47 CE, likely due to poisoning by Agrippina, which is a reoccurring theme throughout this entire story. Fortunately for Agrippina, she had convinced Crispus to name her as his sole heir before his death. So Agrippina and Lucius received his entire estate. Crispus can be seen pictured on this slide. Agrippina married Claudius in 49 CE after his third wife Messalina's death in 48 CE. Claudius was not interested in another marriage, however, he wanted to join the Julian family with the Claudian family because he was never adopted in previously. Claudius then had his daughter Octavia's engagement annulled so she could become married to Nero in the future. Soon after the marriage, Claudius adopted Lucius, which is when his name was changed to Nero Claudius Caesar. Soon around this time, Agrippina allowed Seneca the Younger to return from exile to become Nero's tutor. Seneca heavily influenced Nero's rule 
and his mind throughout his entire life. Eventually, when Nero was 14 years old, he received his toga of manhood, which was known as the toga virialis. This was exceptional at the time because that was very early for his toga. This meant a spot as consulate would be reserved for him when he was 19 years of age. Around this time as well, Britannicus, Claudius's son, was isolated and treated as if he were a boy because he was Nero's rival. Britannicus was around Nero's age. Also, Nero began giving speeches to the Senate in 51 and 52 CE, which progressed his public career. These were more than likely written by his tutor Seneca. In 53 CE, Nero married his stepsister, Octavia. Claudius died in October of 54 CE. Most ancient Roman authors attribute this death to the poisoning with mushrooms by Agrippina. This was likely done because Claudius supported Britannicus and Agrippina wanted Nero to take power. However, these were only rumors. The claim that mushrooms were the food used is likely from Nero's statement saying that mushrooms were food of the gods. Also, it's a possibility that the mushrooms were just poisonous and not tested by Claudius's food tester. At this point, Nero was 17 years old and Nero was presented to the Praetorian Guard by Burrus, who was the leader of the Praetorians. Each member was promised a significant donation if they hailed him as imperator. Britannicus, around this time, was kept indoors, and Claudius's will was suppressed, most likely because it favored Britannicus over Nero and Agrippina. Next, we will discuss when Nero became the Emperor of Rome. Nero became the Emperor of Rome after Claudius's poisoning because Agrippina had uplifted him so much to the Roman aristocracy. He had also suppressed Claudius's son Britannicus, who was likely meant to be the next Emperor of Rome. After Nero's ascent to the throne, Agrippina was respected even more than she was previously. She had received more favor and honor than any other woman of the imperial family. She was even given an official escort, similar to a magistrate, which was unheard of for any woman of the time, nobility or not. Also, the Senate began to meet at Nero's palace, so Agrippina could eavesdrop upon their meetings to help Nero make decisions for the Roman Empire. In 55 CE, Nero began production of coinage, which showcased himself and his mother Agrippina as the faces on the coins. One of the coins even showcased himself and Agrippina directly facing each other. This just shows how much of an influence she was upon Nero. Agrippina handled most of the administrative decisions for Nero, including writing letters to other nations even. Nero was fine with this, however, because ruling was never his main interest, but rather the arts, such as music, acting, and performing, which he had earlier found out through a babysitter. When it came down to it, Agrippina was ruling the empire. However, this was fine with him because he was enjoying the fruits of being emperor with little to no responsibility upon him. Nero went out most every evening under the careful watch of his Roman guards. He went to Roman bars, gambling dens, and brothels. The leader of the guard watching him was a man named Tigellinus, 
who supported and encourages, encouraged Nero's vices. This nourished their relationship. And Tegelinus became one of Nero's most trusted companions throughout his entire rule. One evening, Nero met a woman named Claudia Acte, who served as a slave girl, and they began an affair. This infuriated Agrippina, who eventually put an end to the affair, although he refused at first, which was the first time he had refused his mother's decision. This infuriated Agrippina so much because Nero was never directly related to Claudius, and she thought that this could put his rule into question. After Nero's affair with Claudia Acte, he began to grow hostile towards his mother's overbearingness. He eventually banished her from the palace with the support of his tutor, Seneca. He sent her to the family estate in Antium, which was about 40 miles south of Rome. After this, Agrippina lost her influence upon Roman politics, which meant Nero was left to rule the empire on his own. To win over the people of Rome, Nero provided them with what they wanted, food and money. He founded a national lottery, and whenever he addressed the crowds, he would throw wooden balls with numbers on them, and the people with the winning numbers collected a prize at the palace. These prizes included money, horses, chariots, slaves, and land, which was something everyone wanted at the time. Nero also sponsored games and entertainment for his people, even performing occasionally with songs and poetry himself. Nero provided for his people by giving out free grains and heavily discounted grains. This made Nero's popularity soar among the people because he was providing where they needed, their bellies and their wallets. In 58 CE, Nero began another affair with a woman who had a noble lineage and was highly respected. Her name was Papea Sabina. This enraged Octavia. This affair resulted in Papea becoming pregnant even, something Octavia could never provide for Nero. Papea began to encourage Nero to move away from his mother's overbearingness and control. This resulted in Agrippina giving Nero an ultimatum between her and Papea. Nero chose Papea and made the decision that Agrippina had to die. Nero knew he couldn't have his mom executed because mothers were sacred in Roman society and the people of Rome would not agree with it. So Nero came up with a series of ideas to have her killed and make it look accidental. He tried to poison her three times, but Agrippina caught wind of this and built up an immunity to the poisons or avoided the meals. He made a device that would make the bedroom ceiling fall on her in her sleep. However, she found this out as well and escaped before she could be killed. He then had her put on a ship that was faulty and meant to sink. However, when the ship was sinking, she managed to swim to shore, escaping death once again. When one of Agrippina's messengers came to the palace, Nero claimed the messenger was sent to kill him, although the messenger likely was not. This enabled Nero to convince the Senate to allow Agrippina's execution. Nero then sent a navy officer to Antium to kill Agrippina and finally silence her. Agrippina knew why the officer was there, but tried to claim ignorance. This, however, did not work, so she then pleaded for her life to the officer. She then accepted her fate 
and told the officer to strike her in the womb, the fatal spot that had borne her evil son, Nero. She was then executed in 59 CE by the officer stabbing her repeatedly in the womb. Nero then divorced Octavia in 62 CE and had her banished from Rome. Nero likely waited longer to divorce Octavia because one of his main advisors and leader of the Praetorian Guard, Burrus, died in 62, of C 62 CE of throat cancer. Burrus supported Octavia and was against the divorce. He then married Papea in the same year. He also appointed his close friend Tigellinus as the new leader of the Praetorian Guard in Burrus's place. It is said that Burrus could have been poisoned, however, this is only rumor. After Octavia's banishment from Rome, in her and Nero's divorce, the Roman citizens began to dislike him and his ruling. Octavia was from the bloodline of Augustus, and the public still cared for her and disliked his disrespect for her. Romans began to vandalize artwork of Papea, his wife. This resulted in Tigellinus, the new leader of the Praetorian Guard, dispatching the guard upon the city. This angered the people even more and didn't solve the problem at all. After the public began to turn against him, Nero began to slander Octavia by claiming she had affairs. The people didn't believe him, however, because he had no evidence of this. This enraged Nero, so he had a naval officer claim he and Octavia were having an affair during their marriage. He told the officer he could publicly testify to the Senate about the affair or face execution. This resulted in the officer agreeing. After this, Nero had Octavia executed in 62 CE. This outraged the people and almost resulted in Nero's loss of power. However, ancient historians, historians reported he either hid behind the Praetorian Guard or he began to give out money and food again to win the people back which is another reoccurring theme throughout Nero's rule. After Agrippina, Burrus, and Seneca died or left Rome, he lost his main influences and began doing what he pleased. Seneca had left Rome because he wanted to live a more simple life on the outskirts. He began to focus completely on the arts rather than running the empire. He left the Senate up to making decisions and running Rome, which outraged the Senate. He eventually took up the lyre, he sang, he wrote poetry, and hosted lavish gatherings for artists and performers. Finally, in the last portion of this lecture, I will discuss when Nero lost the support of the Roman aristocracy as well as the Roman public. Nero planned a national tour where he would sing and recite poetry to the people. His advisors suggested he begin outside of Rome in case he wasn't ready for this so he wouldn't ruin his reputation. Nero obliged because one of Nero's biggest fears was ruining his reputation and receiving criticism from his own people. So he began in Antium, where he had grown up as a child. He performed in front of small crowds and to his gratification received praise from the people. 
Eventually, whilst in Antium, he had received a letter from Rome stating the city was on fire. On July 18th of 64 CE, a fire erupted in the Circus Maximus. Circus Maximus was a gathering area for shops, performers, merchants, and the fire was likely due to a cooking fire from one of the shops. The fire spread rapidly, causing mass chaos in the area among the people. It eventually even spread out of the stadium, burning nearby buildings, including homes, shops, and surrounding buildings. The fire was so massive it was impossible to put out and continued for six straight days. While the fire raged on, Nero sat miles away on his balcony of his villa in, the, in Antium, practicing his lyre and his singing. However, once he got a message about the city being on fire, he rushed back to Rome immediately to help in putting out the fire. Once the fire had been put out, Nero began rebuilding Rome. He started with his own palace. He believed this would inspire the people. However, this actually angered the people, and once they realized he planned on seizing several burned city blocks to expand the palace, they became infuriated with him. The new palace would cover over 200 acres of land and be named the Domus Aria, or the Golden House. This new palace would even have a 100 foot tall bronze statue of Nero named Colossus Neronis. This could be seen from almost anywhere in Rome. Nero funded this rebuilding by increasing taxes on the Roman people and through extortion. After the fire, Nero had began to be blamed for the fire. The people believed he started the fire to build a new palace. Nero blamed the fire on the Christians, however, who were already hated by the Roman people. This worked perfectly because the people wanted someone to blame and had already hated Christians. So then, Nero began to crucify Christians in the palace gardens and even lit them on fire to serve as torches at night. Christians were also forced to fight ferocious animals and gladiators in the gladiator arenas. Nero again left running the Roman Empire to the Senate and began performing once again. Nero began performing in Rome at the Neronia, the Neronia which was a Greek-styled festival he had created, which housed shops, performers, and much more. After receiving the praise of the Roman people, Nero was thrilled and joyful. Also around this time, Papea became pregnant with his possible heir to the empire, which would secure his family's power. So around this time, Nero was at an all-time high. Nero, however, still didn't have enough money to fund the rebuild of the palace in Rome, so he requested donations from the wealthy families of Rome. He received only a few small donations, which angered him. He retaliated against the people by declaring that wealthy Romans had to change their wills and leave nearly everything to the emperor when they died. The empire's aristocrats, after this, lost all loyalty towards him. 
He also even raided the temples for funding. The temples had many shrines which people would leave goods and gold and coins at. So Nero dispatched the Praetorians to go collect all of those. This enraged the people of Rome. However, Nero didn't care because he was so focused on the Neronia and performing at the Neronia. So he didn't even acknowledge the public outcry. In 65 CE, Nero's first assassination plot was formed. The Senate came up with a plan to have Nero assassinated and have a Roman statesman named Gaius Piso take his spot at emperor after he was assassinated. They gathered people who were close to Nero to take part in this conspiracy. They even asked Seneca, his old tutor slash advisor, although he denied their invitation. Nero caught wind of this and had the conspirators killed, or they had left Rome before they could have been killed. He also confronted Seneca, but he told him he refused to take part. Nero didn't trust him, however, and made him commit suicide. Papea was said to have said something that set Nero off, maybe commenting upon one of his performances, saying he sung a note wrong, etc. After this, Nero beat his pregnant wife to the floor. Once she was on the ground, he continued to kick her until she had stopped moving. The public would have been outraged hearing this, so Nero claimed she had died from a miscarriage instead. Although he had killed her, Nero was very distraught about her death and held a lavish funeral for her, even having her body embalmed, which was of great significance at the time because most bodies were cremated. From 66 CE to 68 CE, Nero went back on tour in Greece at this time. He was said to have sold out stadiums with audience who had paid to get in. Although he ended his tour early for some reasons that are unknown, some speculate he was still upset about Papea's death. He even met a Greek named Sporus, who had a great resemblance to Papea. When Nero returned, he came back in a triumph, where him and his group of performers were paraded around Rome in the surrounding cities. Triumphs were normally meant for soldiers returning from battle. This infuriated the Senate because he was disrespecting soldiers. After a series of uprisings and Roman lands being lost, the Senate ordered Nero's execution in late 68 CE. They first had the Praetorian Guard leave the palace to go to the Senate, where they would determine Nero was an enemy of the state. Nero woke up in the middle of the night and figured out the palace was empty aside from some palace workers. One of the workers offered up their villa as a hideout luckily for Nero. So Nero left Rome on horseback in his pajamas toward his new hideout. They rode through the night and eventually made it out of Rome and made it to the villa through a secret entrance because Praetorians and soldiers were already on the streets looking for him. 
One of the workers had left the villa and had learned that the Senate had sentenced him to death and the soldiers were looking for him at that exact moment, so he went back and told Nero to his dismay. Also, many citizens had witnessed his escape, so they had a rough idea where, of where he was located and were already outside of the villa looking for him. To avoid public execution and humiliation, which were or which was Nero's biggest fear, humiliation of the public, Nero committed suicide by slitting his throat with a dagger. He actually had one of his workers hold the dagger up to his neck because he was shaking so bad. Nero died on June 9th of 68 CE. My citations include Nero, Volume 2, written by David Schotter, Agrippina, Mother of Nero, by Anthony A. Barrett, The Annals, The Reigns of Tiberius, Claudius, and Nero, by Cornelius Tactus, Life in the Roman World of Nero and St. Paul, by Tucker T.G. Thomas George. Political Dissidents Under Nero, The Price of Dismulation, by Vasily Rudich. And finally, The End of a Dynasty, by Miriam Griffin. My photographic citations are also listed. Thank you all for listening.